To members of the DC Duck community, good evening. And to members of the Greater University of Oregon Alumni Association on the West Coast and everywhere in between, good afternoon. We are so grateful that you're joining us for tonight's event, Treaties, Trickery, and the Pioneer Heritage. My name is Heath Mitchell, and as a board member for the DC Ducks, it is my pleasure to tell you about tonight's event and the organizations that made it possible. The DC Ducks is the Alumni Association for the University of Oregon Alumni Association in the National Capital Region, which exists to represent the U of OAA in the Washington DC area and its surrounding areas as well. We are honored to produce tonight's event in association with Native Duck Nation, the Alumni Association for Native American graduates of the University of Oregon, and are incredibly indebted to the support of the Greater University of Oregon Alumni Association or the UOAA. The UOAA and all of its affiliates exist to strengthen the University of Oregon by fostering lifelong relationships that help ducks, that help ducks become champions, cheerleaders, advocates, and, uh, and ambassadors for the university. Uh, now, I know at the end of this call, everyone is going to be very eager to jump off the line and call someone up and tell them about everything you've just learned, but I implore you to hang around for just a minute because I want to tell you about the next great event that the U of OAA uh, Alumni Association is going to be putting on. And we'd, we'd love for you to take our very, very short survey at the end of this, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We are honored this evening to host uh, University of Oregon Assistant Vice President, Dr. Jason Yonker. Dr. Yonker is the advisor to President Schill on sovereignty and government to government relations at the University of Oregon as a member of the Coquille Indian tribe. Uh, tonight's discussion will be guided by the U of O uh, Alumni Association's Executive Director, Rafe Beck. Uh, We're grateful for his assistance and it is my pleasure to have Rafe tell you a little more about tonight's featured guest now. Rafe. Great, thanks very much, Heath. And uh, thank you also to the DC Ducks and the Native Duck Nation, two of our many UOAA alumni chapters for sponsoring this event. Uh, I'd like to start off our event tonight with a land acknowledgement statement. The University of Oregon in Eugene is located within the traditional homelands of the Southern Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my partner in crime tonight, Jason Yonker. As Heath mentioned, Jason's the Assistant Vice President and the advisor to the President of the University on Sovereignty and Government-to-Government -government Relations at the University of Oregon, and he's a citizen of the Coquille Indian Tribe. Jason received his PhD in Anthropology from the UO and returned to Oregon after teaching at Rochester Institute of Technology for a decade. Jason received the prestigious Eli S. Parker Award for the American Indian Science and Engineering Society for his work with tribal governments and students in higher education. He is the past president of the Association of Indigenous Anthropologists, and he is originally from Coos Bay. Welcome, Jason. Hello, everybody. It's great to be broadcasting from the best coast ever. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. And um, to start off, let me ask you this. Can you just tell me about your role at the UO? What does it mean to be an advisor to the president on sovereignty and government to government relations? Oh, uh, goodness. Um, there's actually lots of moving parts in that question. And there's many things that I get to do. And I'm very fortunate that University of Oregon is one of 13 universities across the nation that have a position just like this. Uh, we were the first, however, to have the position report directly to the president and many more institutions are starting that kind of uh, direct communication. It's really important when you think about the tribes, uh, there's 574 across the United States, nine in the state of Oregon, um, 43 that we recognize as uh, residents of Oregon, but they may be on uh, bordering states. A good example of that, um, they're either on bordering states or they've been removed to very far away locations like the Modoc used to be from Southern Oregon, Northern California, and they're now in 
Oklahoma. So we do recognize that sometimes there's uh, gaps in history that need to be um, fixed. And, and the U of O has been very, very good at that um, as, as early as um, uh, Miles Brand, who uh, committed to building a new longhouse at the U of O campus. But my job in particular is to manage for President Schill um, the uh, relationships between uh, the president and the tribal governing bodies within the, in particular, the uh, nine federally recognized tribes here in the state of Oregon. I also manage his Native American Advisory Council. Um, we meet face to face three times a year, once a quarter. Uh, I don't know of any university that does it that frequently. And I'm quite certain that no university in the United States has a advisory council that includes all of the federally recognized tribes in their state to serve uh, with the president. So there's, there's quite a few things that on the government to government level that I have to navigate, but I also have to be a resource on campus, whether it be for um, helping in admissions or um, the, assisting the backbone of our institution, the, the faculty and staff um, on things that uh, might come up. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of things that are moving parts in this job. And uh, it's almost hard to remember. We have, I haven't been in my office since March 12th. So I know that you asked me to describe a typical day. I'm, I can't quite remember what a typical day looks like. A typical day is, is waking up and going to your home office like everybody else, I guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, good. Thanks. It sounds like a very broad job. Um, now, uh, a reminder to our, our audience that we welcome your questions. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen there. And in the second half of, the, of this event, we'll, we'll go to questions in the audience. But Jason, you and I had talked about a question that had come in in advance and that you say is a very common question that you get. Is it Native American, Indian, First Nations, something else? If I want to say the right thing, what should I be saying? Well, I, I explain it to my students in this in these ways. Um, you know, it's American Indian, Alaska Native. Um, Ala people from Alaska are Alaska Natives, the indigenous from up there. People from Canada, Canada are not Americans, so they don't like to be called American Indians. They are First Nations, First Peoples. Uh, First Peoples is that broad um umbrella for anybody who's uh, indigenous. And certainly you have to be standing in the right location to call yourself first, first people. Um, but I explain it to my students like this. If you were going and traveling abroad and somebody uh, from that country asked you, where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from the United States. Oh, yeah, well, where in the United States? Well, I'm, I'm from Oregon. Oh, really, where in Oregon? Well, I'm from the coast. Where on the coast? Coos Bay. Oh, where did you grow up? I grew up on South Slough of Coos Bay. So, and all of those tend to be true, but the, the answer is once you know where somebody is from, that's how you refer to them. So you guys know that I'm Coquel and I'm from Coos Bay. And so now you would then refer to me as Coquel, neither American Indian nor Alaska Native, which is not me. So um, generally speaking, American Indian, Alaska Native is, is how it shows up in, in the federal documents, and that's what we're kind of stuck with. So. Good. Okay. I have another question of cultural understanding for you then. So we started off this event with a land acknowledgement statement, and that's a pretty normal thing at the UO recently, but it may be new to a lot of our audience members. Can you, for those who aren't familiar, what is a land acknowledgement statement? Well, it's always good, and it's, it's actually a cultural practice for American Indians, but it is a very good uh, humanitarian practice, I think, to demonstrate that you are humble 
and dependent upon the things that are around you. And in, and, and in fact, if you do take notice of all of those resources around you and give thanks for those, you're less likely to abuse them. American Indians start every uh, event with a contextual uh, acknowledgement. It wouldn't necessarily be a land acknowledgement, but uh, recognizing the host and recognizing that you are just uh, somebody who is humble and meek and, and um, you, you want to be a good person to your host and, and that's how you would do it. So the Kalapuya were the caretakers of the Willamette Valley, Willamette Valley. this we know. And the descendants now are residents, are citizens of either the Siletz or the Grand Ronde, or in many cases in other tribes as well. And we need to recognize that they created what um, David Douglas said, a Garden of Eden here in Oregon. And that's that's what we have to be thankful for, is that they took care of it. In fact, they still are, just in, it's much difficult, more difficult for them these days. Great, great. Let, let's talk about the pioneer statues a little bit. Uh, we're talking about the pioneer, also sometimes called the pioneer father, and then of course the pioneer mother. Do you, can you tell us anything about the history of the statues? Do you know where they came from or how long they've been on campus? Um, let's see, the Pioneer, well, it was originally called the Pioneer, uh, Pioneer Father was, and he was unveiled in 1919 based on an individual that did cross the plains, and then Pioneer Mother didn't show up until about 1932. It wasn't because she was on a trail uh, and, and got lost, it's just uh, that's how sometimes things go, a little bit <laughs> slower. Uh, but they... Um, were presented by the same um, artist, Proctor, Alexander Proctor was his name, and he said, and I had to write this down because I found it kind of typical, I guess, uh, that the statues uh, typify the real spirit of the West, uh, representing all that is noblest and best in our history, men and women who saved the West for this country, so that their children might enjoy the fruits of their labor. And that is a reflection of um, either willful ignorance of what history actually, what actually happened, or it's a portrait of what we want to believe. A conquering history is a much more glamorous story than it is when you talk about the real history of America. And so sometimes we have to do our best to uh, think of ways to redefine some of these historical monuments um, that aren't exactly um, what we know our uh, country was built upon. Uh, as an institution of higher learning, we try to get to the absolute truth and the facts and to have the statues on campus. I know this is difficult for many of those who um, recognize those statues as important on campus, but sometimes you have to figure out creative ways to make them more accurate. And um, unfortunately, the pioneer mother and pioneer father represented something that didn't take, really take place. Um, there were a hundred million American Indians in North America, South America, and within a hundred years, they were whittled down uh, to 5%. And so how did that happen? It wasn't a free and clear landscape as many would want to believe. Um, poisoned blankets, germ 
warfare. I mean, things that were called massacres, where only a few uh, non-natives were killed, but two to 300 natives were killed. Um, they're talking about the, not the natives as being a massacre, but as uh, individuals who are non-native uh, being massacred. So some of these things are really tough to swallow, um, especially for the First Peoples of America. I, and here's a good example, I, I would say. Um, among uh, the Hopi and the Navajo in particular, they have a symbol that um, means healing. Mm -hmm. And that symbol reflects all things that are good. Um, that symbol was taken by Adolf Hitler and made into something entirely different. Um, if we had had that symbol here on the campus and it had meant healing and good, but in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and after that, uh, it became something much different, um, Native Americans would have been the first to take down symbols like that. And so we would hope that others would have that kind of respect for um, tough situations, which, which that is for us. Mm -hmm. And now before we talk about what happened with the statues most recently, am I right, some students expressed concerns to the administration about the statues uh, a little more than a year ago, am I right? Yes. And were those concerns similar to what you're saying now? What kind of, can you tell us, walk us through what happened then and, and how the administration responded? Well, it happened to be a, the 100 year anniversary of the statues. There have been Native American protests uh, surrounding those statues, but in this, in this case, it was the 100th year. Um, a small reminder, it was a peaceful protest. The president received, um, uh, letters of concern. Um, but as we all know, the University of Oregon is a wonderful place where you can share your opinion. And we are the foundation, it, some, it seems at times, for social consciousness. Um, we have a long history in that area. So uh, to have that kind of demonstration and then to be part of um, what was eventually going to be the solution. Uh, President Schill put together a task force to take a look at um, not only uh, things that were on campus um, in the statuaries, uh, but also other potential uh, um, soft spots that we could probably make improvements. Uh, that report is just now finishing up. Uh, so we did not have a chance. We've been kind of uh, be, had other things to be concerned with uh, since that, that protest. But um, that was one of the um, things that I was very hopeful for, that the university would have an opportunity to confront what the statues mean to a larger group of individuals than simply those who remember it as a location on campus. Um, it, that we should uh, challenge what the current meanings are as, a, as opposed to what the meanings were when they were first erected. Uh, there's a really good um, thing that the Coquels always say, it's, never memorialize me. Um, and that's because, uh, it, and that means don't make a permanent memorialization of you because then it would be even more traumatic to a family to have to remove that kind mm. of representation. So it's all about not placing your burden onto future generations. 
Um, I was really hopeful to uh, play a role in guiding the university in a respectful way of figuring out what should be done with the pioneer statues, but we really didn't get that chance. We got because, as you say, that that report took uh, sounds like took a little more than a year to come in. Yes. So in the meantime, uh, there were some renewed calls to to consider the statues more recently over the past year, and and then of course vandals took them down one night. Uh, was there any warning this might happen? You know what? All of the protests were downtown. Um, I, you know, I didn't hear of a thing that was on campus, and I found out about it um, seeing it in the newspaper the next day. Um, so I, we didn't know that uh, it was going to come to this. I do know that when the 19 or when the Native students protested um, earlier that um, people had defaced uh, Pioneer Mother uh, lightly. Uh, and I was asked whether or not it was my people <laughs> that, that, that had what did they mean? What did they mean by that, your people? <laughs> well, you know, I walked out there to take a look at what it was uh, to uh, uh, the damage to the uh, pioneer mother, and somebody had hung a a sign on her. It said "No rest for the Cali Calipuya," mm. but they misspelled Calipuya. So, mm -hmm. you know, we know how to spell Calipuya. Just <laughs> some others don't. So, I I suspect that those who are sensitive to these issues um, are and willing to deface things uh, don't have access to the proper ways of getting things changed. Mm -hmm. And so they, that causes stress and they do other things. And un that's unfortunate because I think we could have made a long-term uh, gesture of goodwill to not only the Kalapuya, but to all of the tribes across the nation who would be watching us. They're watching us right now with our Native American Advisory Council, with a, with a, a high-ranking Native American advising the president. And then had we had something like removing the the pioneers or retiring the statues or uh, recontextualizing the history, uh, that makes a statement to future Native American students. It's kind of like having a longhouse on your campus, which we do, a wonderful, wonderful longhouse. Native American students see that you have a longhouse, a place that looks familiar to them from where they are. And they are more likely to come to an institution that is that has things like that. However, if you have a swastika, which means something to Native Americans, but you can't display it, or you have a pioneer mother or a pioneer father, uh, it, it's a deterrent to your desire to come to the University of Oregon. We need, to, we need to represent historical fact because this is where you learn. And to teach falsities is not our mission. So Jason, if I understand you correctly, there are, people, lots of, there are many people who expressed a uh, desire for the statues to come down. The statues came down, but is there a downside in the way they came down? Did we miss an opportunity? We did miss an opportunity, and I would have liked to have played a role in that. They just didn't come down as fast as other people wanted them to, uh, and, which tells me that uh, the people that had a hand in removing them were likely not Native. We have longer strategies. Uh, the strategies that we're building for the institution right now um, 
uh, with our future stewards program, with uh, you know the food pantry in our in our longhouse, with uh, NDN Indian uh, Native Duck Nation, um, all of these play a role in a several generations down the road. So I think I think somebody wanted them down quickly, and they took it into their hands, uh, which unfortunately left us without that opportunity to make a grander statement and to elevate the university in ways that we we no longer have uh, mm -hmm. concerning the statutes. Now, I, I, um, I have the pleasure of getting a lot of email feedback from alumni about just about anything alumni want to get feedback on to the university. Yeah. And uh, when the statutes came down, I got a number, maybe a dozen messages from people who said some form of, why did the administration let this happen? Hmm. Meaning, why did they let Van, why did the administration let vandals take down the statues? Do you, what do you think about that phrase thing? Did the administration let this happen? Uh, well, to be in administration, you get blamed for everything. You're <laughs> nobody's, fr I lost all my friends when I became an administrator. Uh, you, it's hard to please everyone. And if you think about the circumstances when they were taken down uh, during the, the riots, uh, I, I don't think that when riots happen downtown, you immediately call campus safety and say, get out in front of those statues because mm -hmm. they're going down next. Um, it's, it's just, it's not practical to be able to do that. So yeah. the administration didn't allow these to come down. That's, yeah. that's not true. Now, that once the statues are down, President Schill decided not to put them back on their, on their pedestals. Do you know why he made that decision or did you have any role in advising him about that? Well, again, we were preparing the report for President Schill when COVID came out, when we sent everybody home. Um, and so uh, President Schill is very calculated and is not a knee-jerk reaction individual, which is very good in the president. And uh, to arbitrarily just put them right back up would potentially lead to them coming right back down. Uh, but you wait for people to get back onto campus, you wait for tensions to drop, and you figure out how to get to a possible solution. So I, I'm quite certain that that's uh, what we will do um, once we figure out um, our COVID plans, once things return to as normal as they can, then, then we figure out what, what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So I have one more question for you, and then we'll, we'll go to questions from the audience. So I just want to remind people tuning in that you can submit questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So we look forward to addressing some of those. Let me ask you, Jason, in your role as the liaison to Oregon's Confederated Tribes, have you heard from any of the tribal leaders you work with about the statues coming down? Has there been any reaction from the tribes? Yes, I received two calls. The first one said, that didn't take you very long to get them down. <laughs> you know, I said, well, yeah, because I'm fat and I just say topple right over. They were grateful. You know, I received two calls and they said, I'm glad those things came down. Are you putting them back up? And I said, we don't know yet. Um, I was kind of hoping we would be able to do this in concert with the tribes. Um, but, you know, hearing from two of the nine, I'm pretty happy about, you know, how they're feeling with it. I would say it's accurate that they're happy that these uh, historical markers are down. Um, will the next time that we meet with the advisory council, we of course will ask them how they feel about the statues. And, th and then you take that into account when you're trying to figure out what you need to do in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the good thing about uh, tribes are, and, and the, de the, the democracy that tribes go through, many tribes go through, it, it, it comes from the Iroquois Confederacy, the, the Haudenosaunee people, and the Washington uh, Wampum Belt. It shows two lines running side by side, uh, always in line with each other, in sight of each other, but never crossing each other, just being aware. And that's what the Native American Advisory Council does. These are our concerns, but you have to manage your own campus. And if uh, the concerns cross with the decisions of a campus, then there's consequences to that. But we have a very good working relationship with our tribes here in Oregon. Uh, they advise us wisely, and I don't think that they would uh, sincerely impose upon us um, anything that would go against our core mission. Uh, they might uh, discuss displeasure, and that's why you talk first and figure things out and talk it through. And, and I think uh, the relationship with the tribes between uh, the chairs and President Schill is at an all-time all high. We're trying to figure things um, out that is mutually beneficial. And the statues at this moment are not even on tribal radars. I mean, the question we, we just got from the audience, where are the statues located now? They are in storage, in safe storage. So if you know where, well. I don't know if you want to tell everyone where they are. No, I can't. Or if you know. No, I can't. I won't do but that. But they're not, they're not they're back on the pedestal. Storage. No, they're not. And nor are they a boat anchor either. So nor are safe. they a boat anchor. OK, they're safe. <laughs> Um, let me ask you, we're, our, our event today is co-hosted by the DC Ducks chapter, and a lot of the people tuning in are, are in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, as you know, the local NFL team recently announced they'll no longer be known as the Redskins, and they, they haven't quite announced what they are going to be. Um, that was a long time coming. Do, do you see any similarities in the, in the conversation that led to that change or in the way the conversation happened on campus about the Pioneer statues? Um, in the 60s, uh, we had uh, the Civil Rights Movement, and out of that grew the American Indian Movement. Of course, our movements were fractionalized all across America from the 1850s on, uh, but it really coalesced in the 60s. So we benefited from other civil unrest. Um, again, I think we will benefit from the civil unrest that we have right now, I think it's good to, to look at our country and know that we are an infant when it comes to as many years as we've been organized. There are natural changes that need to happen for us to become more perfect or better. And I think uh, we're we're experiencing some growing pains right now. Um, as far as the mascot for the Washington team, that should have been gone a long, long time ago. That was purely racist. Everybody knows it's racist. Uh, I, I can't explain why uh, it had been kept on for this long, but I'm glad that it's gone. So would you say, is the, is the Black Lives Matter movement, is it good for the Native community? I would say at this point, we don't know if it's good for the community, but there have been changes that have um, brought us together. And that's always good. I think when you go through civil unrest, um, you go through some healing pains, but you end up better in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we will get to at some point. And one of our participants is asking, uh, well, first of all, is there, to, to your knowledge, is there any coordination with the Black, with, 
uh, the Native community and the Black Lives, Black, Black Lives Matter movement? As far as student organizations, the affinity groups really do support each other well. Um, but I don't think that there's any uh, uh, coordination between BLM and any Native American movement that's going on, on a national scale. But, but on campus, there, you're saying there's, there's a lot of alignment between different groups? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of our uh, audience members is asking if you can address the, the special and unique relationship status that Indian nations have with the U.S. and contrast the quote unquote one size fits all approach when it comes to underrepresented minorities. Is that all? And uh, well, I'll leave that. I'll, le I'll leave that to you to decipher. <laughs> um, well, as far as American Indians, um, we were never conquered. You don't need treaties if you're conquered. <laughs> you just conquer them and then you tell them what to do. All of us signed treaties. 100% of those treaties were broken. In fact, in Oregon, especially Western Oregon, not only were the treaties never ratified, but they, uh, it took them until the uh, 70s to actually recognize that these people still existed. Um, there is no one size fits all um, for affinity groups. The difference is that uh, American Indians who are enrolled in a federally recognized tribe are members of a sovereign domestic nation. It's not based on the way you look uh, or, or anything else. You have to be a citizen. It's like being American. You can have a um, want to be an American, but unless you actually are, you can't call yourself one. Um, we have a lot of people who tend to say, I, I am a Native American, but I can't prove it. Well, try getting across the border, any U.S. border saying, I am American and I can't prove it. It doesn't make you an American. Mm -hmm. So for American Indians, um, uh, when it comes to, to protecting our sovereignty, that's really all we have left, and we protect it at all costs. Um, some have treaties that are stronger than others who had treaties that were never ratified, like out in, in Western Oregon. The diversity initiatives that we have a very strong diversity initiative uh, here on campus, there isn't a one size fits all. And if you try to make it a one size fits all, it never works. I haven't seen one work that way. You have to know that Latinos are coming from one perspective, that uh, Black Americans are coming from another perspective, and then you throw the American Indians in who, there. Uh, how do you leave people out who identify with being American Indian? Uh, that's where it gets complicated because American Indians are enrolled citizens in a nation. So it, there is no one size fits all. And it is, uh, Dr. Alex Alessandro has uh, perhaps the hardest job on campus. You want to explain who that is just in case some people uh, don't know who she is? She is the Vice President of Diversity and Equity. So speaking of sovereignty and treaties, uh, one of our audience members asked, how does the recent Supreme Court case in Oklahoma affect local tribes in Oregon? So that was a case that went way back and said, you know what, the U.S. actually doesn't necessarily have all the jurisdiction here that we claim to, uh, that uh, local tribes may have jurisdiction. What, what's, the, what's the ripple effect on that? It strengthens all. It strengthens all of American Indians' uh, uh, claims to historical truth. So, for example, the Coquille Indian tribe, uh, we had a treaty. We had actually two treaties. Um, the treaty 
and a map that was associated with the treaty that was to show Congress where all of these uh, vestiges were and, and all the things that we were giving up uh, were sent to Congress uh, in the 1800s, but the map was lost. The treaties remain. And so Congress said, ah, no map, we can't consider the treaties. But in the meantime, they had removed the Coquel and everybody from Western Oregon up to the Great Coast Reservation. But when you're at the Great Coast Reservation and you don't have a ratified treaty, you don't have any provisions coming in from the government. So most starved or died from disease or ran away. Uh, it wasn't until 1888 that they found that map. They read the treaties, but there was no Indian problem in Oregon by then. It wasn't until uh, 1994, 1995, that my brother and I were looking in College Park at the map archives, and we came across that map. And when we were growing up, we were told, uh, I, I was terminated. I said, how come I'm not Indian? And they said, because they lost the map. And you could tell by the way people said that, that it was painful, it was hurtful, and, and don't ask that question again. Uh, and, and you don't, you don't want to cause anybody pain. So, you know, after growing up a while, I started saying that, that same thing. Oh, they lost the map. I'm not Indian, they lost the map. I'm, I must be something else, uh, but I, I'm definitely not Indian. And so, my brother and I made copies of that map, part of the Southwest Oregon Research Project, and we brought it back. And I told people on my tribal council, they had a big meeting, and they said, well, what did you find in Washington, D.C.? And we told them about, you know, growing up and hearing about the lost map. And then we unrolled the map and told them that this was the lost map. And people just wept. And, and all of us were crying because we knew that the single piece of paper meant the difference between us having a treaty and a landscape that was familiar to where we were at that particular point with nothing except for a brand new tribal council and learning about all of the stuff that happened to us. Because before then, you have history telling you. you. You have a captured audience when you're going through from kindergarten to high school. And they tell you what happened, even though it's, it doesn't match up with what you have been told. Whenever things like in Oklahoma happen, it starts to, you get to peek behind the curtain of all of these little different things that are very, very significant in piece, significant pieces of the puzzle in history that have been overwritten by other individuals who wanted it to be a heroic story, a conquering story, a pioneering story. That is a much more glamorous line than it is, we killed everybody. Mm -hmm. We took their land away. We made treat, did so with treaties. We did so with poison blankets. That story isn't a fun Christian narrative. And that's what our history was built upon, the right to manifest, manifest destiny, those with God inherit the earth. And that's how um, it was justified in some of the things that were done to American Indians. So the things that are happening in Oklahoma, that, that just helps every single one of us uh, tribes. Um, it adds credibility to some of the things that we've already been, we've been saying all along. The story of you and your brother finding that map, that sounds pretty heroic, too. That, that sounds like something out of a movie. Have you decided who you want to play you in the movie? Um, Elvis. 
right. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. I want to go back to a question from the audience. Um, it's a long one. I'm going to read the first part. How do you explain to non-Indigenous people why it's acceptable to use the term Indian country versus calling Indigenous people Indians? It goes on for a while, but I'm going to, I'm going to, um, and it, and it ends. I am wondering what is it, what's a different way to explain this to non-Indigenous folks? So maybe this was written by someone Indigenous. Well, we all know Columbus was lost. Uh, and he didn't discover America. He discovered a uh, hundred million people. So unfortunately he thought he was in the Indies and he called them Indians. Um, and that sticks. Uh, it's convenient, it's easy, it's fast. When I'm in class, I say Indian all the time. I know that's incorrect, but I say it all the time because I'm talking quickly and I'm trying to explain some things. And American Indian Alaska Native doesn't roll off the tongue as quick as Indian does. Indian country, I like Indian country. I like, uh, we, we, as American Indians have survived as long as we have because we have humor. Humor saved us. And you can see a straight faced Native American walk up to them and start talking with them. And I guarantee there's a joke in there that either you're not catching because it's a straight face or you end up uh, it's an A, you know, something like that to catch them on your joke. Uh, so Indian, Indian country, Indian country is still one of my, uh, it's one of my favorite. Uh, Indian country today is one of my favorite newspapers. One of the reasons why I suggested NDN is because that's how us natives spell Indian. That's the reservation way of saying, that's the street way of saying Indian. Is Indian. That's, so that's why our alumni group is called Native Duck Nation? That's right. Just for Indian. It's a little message. <laughs> Jason, we've, we've, talked about, we've talked about monuments, uh, statues and monuments. We've talked a little bit about sports franchises. A question came in, um, these are the issues that tend to grab headlines right now. Do they, do they overlook more significant issues tribes are facing today? What, what should the headlines be? We are the poorest communities across the nation. Um, the one way out of that predicament is through education. And at one point, American education meant boarding schools, taking children away from the ages of five to 18 and then returning them to a community that didn't recognize them because they didn't know all the things that a native community would know. Uh, the oldest boarding school uh, in America is Chamawa Indian School, just north of here in Salem. I happen to sit on their uh, board of directors. The new uh, understanding of American education is uh, if an individual makes it through high school is to find a way for them to afford higher education. The more uh, educated, uh, college bearing, college uh, degree bearing Native Americans we have, the better they are to operate our new and emerging uh, markets. Um, if we don't have any new and emerging markets, they're the ones to help pull us out of uh, uh, the poor class. But there is no one poorer than Native Americans. Um, we, we had a student that, I mean, when we sent students away from the university because of COVID, we had 20, 28 Native American students with little or no internet. One of those students, they, had, they lived in a community that had to drive 50 miles to get fresh water. Mm. Uh, this is in the wealthiest country in America. 
uh, the indigenous with treaties with a government that said, we will take care of you. Um, as long as the grass shall grow, that is the verbiage in, in uh, all of our treaties. Mm -hmm. So um, I think with, if, if a diverse initiative includes uh, Native American relations, then we start seeing the historical narrative change. If it hadn't happened that the Southwest Oregon Research Project exists, if we didn't get that done, I don't think some of the, the new education material that tribes are presenting today for, um, for uh, education, for schools, um, would have come about. So these types of things help move us along into a more accurate presentation of what American history was, but also represents the contributions that the First Peoples had in this landscape. Uh, we're having a dialogue uh, in, with increasing volume about reparations in this country mm -hmm. coming out of the African American community. Does the Native community talk about reparations? Is that a way out if we're talking about the, the poverty in, the, in these communities? Well, we gave up on reparations when they started whittling down the, the treaties themselves. Uh, so, you know, reparations, real, the Coquel got reparations uh, in the 1940s um, after giving up 800,000 acres of old growth timber and silver and gold and water and land, uh, the US government found it in their good willing hearts to give us um, reparations at five cents an acre, which is the assessed value in 1855. So, Reparations, I don't think, can ever come about adequately. So I think reparations should come in a form that would be more helpful. If, if I had a magic wand, I would get free education uh, college education for, for Native Americans. That's the least we can do for individuals who have been promised something by the wealthiest government in the world and it didn't come through. We impose our will all across the globe, yet in our own backyard. So Australia, we told them, you need to take care of those Aborigines. We told the Germans, you need to give that stuff back. Um, I mean, give that stuff back. And then, of course, the Native American Grazing Repatriation Act came. You know, all of these things we end up doing after we've told somebody else to do it. So I, if I had a magic wand, I would want uh, education to be paid for by the federal government for all citizens of sovereign domestic nations. Because I know in 20 years, 40 years, 100 years, then we have tribal leadership that can manage their affairs in different ways than we are having to struggle with now. Can you give our audience a sense of uh, how big the native student population is at Oregon right now? Mm. There are 71 citizens of federally recognized tribes on our campus. Um, most of them are in state. There are a total of 162 uh, th those who identify with being Native American, but only 71 are citizens. That's actually a high ratio for any college in America. I think every college should be very ambitious when it comes to uh, their diversity their diversity initiatives. They should uh, reflect the diversity within their state by percentage. So our student body 
has um, 22, 23,000 students. Uh, in the state of Oregon, Latinos make up about 11%, and we have about 14% here on campus. African Americans, um, the population is like 4%, maybe even 5 and that's what we have here on campus. For Native Americans, the population in the state is 1.8%, and we have 0.5. So we're not doing a very good job when it comes to attracting large enough populations from, from the Native American communities. The problem is there is a great difference between out-of-state and in-state uh, tuition. There are not enough Native Americans within the state of Oregon to bring us up, a uh, college age, to bring us up to that 1.8%. We have to rely upon Natives from very poor communities being able to afford to pay that out-of-state tuition. And, and I think that that's probably our best opportunity for change, maybe not right at this moment, mm -hmm. because we're going through some very difficult times. But if we had our eye on that as a goal, if we reach that goal in 10 years, I'm happy. If we reach it in 20 years, I'm still happy. Uh, we need to have that as a goal to at least reflect the state's population. Well, Jason, we're coming up on an hour, but before I hand it back to Heath, I wanna end on a, here's a fun one. Question from the audience is, now that the longhouse is closed, where can I get a fry bread taco? <laughs> well, you can come to my house, but you have a 14 day <laughs> quarantine downstairs. <laughs> Those I think that's... tacos are the best. <laughs> we, we still, we sell out every time we have a fry bread sale or a taco <laughs> sale. And I've been bugging the students um, I said, I will buy you the signs to put them out there in front of the law center. I already got permission to put them out there. And they said, we can't even keep up with the lunch hour. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how resourceful our students are. Um, they're getting ready. You know, how, how are they going to have, we were, we had our powwow at the 52nd annual, the longest running powwow in the nation, uh, college powwow. And they said, we can't break that streak. So they did an online powwow. We had Miss Indian World. We had everybody from across the nation participating in this online powwow. So, I, you know, I am extraordinarily proud of all of the students that are here, our, our, not only our leadership, but our Native American faculty who are very shorthanded who have to tend to all of these Native Americans as well. Um, that is our cultural obligation to, uh, when you have advanced to the pass down your information, you have to pass down and mentor. And, and all of our, our faculty and staff do such a wonderful job with that. I, it makes uh, life for me much easier. Jason, I want to thank you for spending this time with us this evening. It's really a wonderful conversation. Uh, I want to say thanks again to both the DC Ducks and the Native Duck Nation, NDN, and uh, both groups. You'll, you'll get a, uh, everyone participating today will get a survey asking if they'd be interested to uh, help out with one or, or both of those groups. So I hope you'll I hope you'll consider that. I'm going to hand it back to Heath now. Thanks, Heath. Thank you, Rafe, and thank you, Dr. Yonker, really so much for sharing your insights tonight. Um, I wanted to make one more plug for the post-event survey, so please take a few seconds to take care of that. And you could join the UOAA on August 26th for their event, Welcome to the City. It's happening all over the country for new arrivals in any given place looking to connect with their, uh, their local chapters. So on behalf of uh, DC Ducks and the rest of the University of Oregon Alumni Association, thank you so much for participating in tonight's event and uh, have a wonderful, wonderful evening.